And today, uh, we have Danny Schneider introducing us. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Josh. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Bill Cohen, professor of sociology at the University of Maryland. Uh, Professor Cohen received his PhD from Maryland, and then previously, before returning, held appointments at UC Irvine and UNC. He's authored dozens, dozens, I may turn to the plural, definitely, dozens of journal articles on topics including occupational segregation, gender, housework, and family dynamics. And this work has been funded by ASA, NSF, Russell Sage, the Center for Equitable Growth, and has garnered multiple section awards from the ASA. Professor Cohen has also made fundamental contributions to the public understanding of sociology and really to inform the public debate quite generally, uh, by which I mean he has debated with other well-informed people, and he has also brought information to bear on otherwise uninformed debate. Um, both are a service, uh, um, and he has done so as the author of a textbook on the family, as the author of the widely read blog, Family Inequality, and as co-editor of Context, and now as the founder of Social Archive. So we're delighted to have him here today to present on the implications of race and equality for delaying births as anti-poverty policy. Thank you. Please welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, and your hospitality so far has, so far has been great. <laughs> so I appreciate that very much. Uh, uh, humanizing backstory. Last time I was here was 1999. I was interviewing for a postdoc. Last minute, I already had offered my offer from Irvine. I hadn't quite accepted it, but the last minute they considered me for the Robert Johnson thing here, so I rushed up here to meet with Mike Hout, and I, could, I not only was late to f finding this place and like, going to meet with him, when I sat down to meet with him, I immediately like really had to go to the bathroom, and then I <laughs> confused him with Bob Hauser, and then I stopped our interview in the middle to go to the bathroom and come back, and then continued uh, still thinking, not really literally thinking he was Bob Hauser, but thinking that the ASA session that Bob Hauser was in the middle of organizing was he was in the middle, and we just kept kind of going back and forth on this, I'm not doing an ASA session, but it seems like such an interesting Anyway. Uh, and then he offered me the postdoc. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't accept it, and so I went to Irvine instead. And I'm very delighted to be back, although I confess I actually feel nervous because of that experience. <laughs> I'm imprinted. Mike with is that. 3,000 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. He's watching. There is also the possibility that Mike, uh, Mike will um, show up to correct anything I say at this point here. Like he does you know, on Twitter. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Okay, um, so in this um, talk, I'm going to um, sort of make a, uh, uh, sort of have an argument about anti-poverty policy for a little while, and then I'll give some evidence, some sort of research that's related to that, but it doesn't I completely cohere into a project, and so as part of what I, my question is, I could just keep polemicizing about this and about poverty indefinitely, but if there's some way I could make the research actually help with that. I'd be interested in, um, in trying to do that. So that's sort of where, where this, um, this project is. Um, it's easy to do little empirical bits of it. And the question is, how do they contribute? And so that's sort of what I'm asking. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the issue of delayed um, uh, childbearing as uh, an anti-poverty um, um, uh, uh, platform piece um, in the context of this weathering hypothesis, the weathering um, work from Arlene Geronimus. And then um, the evidence I'll present will be about birth and, and marriage timing and sort of the health implications and then talk a little bit about um, what race and moral condemnation have to do with um, anti-poverty policy. Um, so uh, uh, many of you are probably familiar with this, but I'll briefly just describe what, where I'm coming from on the, on the issue of the uh, weathering and, and birth timing. Um, the idea is, and it's described in this one article that I like, just give you the year there, but she has a, um, a nice description of it in this piece um, where she uh, talks about sort of the cultural salience of uh, delayed parenthood for whites um, and um, uh, juxtaposes that with the public health evidence that um, early parenthood is healthier for black women. Um, and so as a result of that, their minority and um, subordinate status, their different from white pattern of birth timing and the intense salience of delayed birth as a goal for white families opens, um, uh, results in a strong sort of pattern of moral condemnation, um, sort of as an othering strategy um, directed at black women and their families. And so that's sort of the context for this. Um, just to give you one sort of snapshot picture that relates to the, um, 
Uh, the weathering, the, the, the argument of weathering is um, uh, black women's health deteriorates faster than white women's over their life course. And so if you are planning your family um, uh, and you want to remain, you want to be a healthy parent and you want your, especially your mother to be a healthy grandparent, um, uh, it may be smarter, all else being equal, to have your children earlier. So this is just one way. You could do this with disability rates or other specific conditions. I did this just with um, uh, the percentage of people saying, describing their health as fair or poor, which is a pretty good indicator of, of bad health. And you can see um, the top line is black women with a high school degree or less, and these are, are women who are mothers, so living with their own children. And you can see by age 50, about a quarter of them would describe their health as fair or poor, um, compared to um, white women with a high school degree or more, which is less than 10%. And so if you're sort of thinking, if you're a, if you're a, an 18 to 25 to 30-year-old woman and you're thinking about your mother helping to take care of your kids and you're thinking about her health, this is one way to think about that. Okay, so it's just one illustrative way and there's lots of other, been lots of other research following on that. But most of these um, gaps are where people date ages. It's not so pronounced to say up to 30 but right. It's not much wider than 35, exactly. Well, yeah, but we're talking about, if you're talking about grandmothers. Yeah, but that's the argument about grandparents, not so much about maternal yes. birth and well, health at birth. And... Yes, we will get to that, okay. if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll get to that exact uh, thing. Yes. Uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> but any, any questions you have, um, that's fine. If, and if I um, want to, um, if I don't want to take them, I, I'll let you know. But, uh, but that's, that's fine. That's good. Um, okay, so, um, so given, so um, uh, those colors are supposed to be more different. I'm sorry, they were on my own. Um, the, the, this is the black uh, women's age distribution. This is the distribution of age um, just for the women who had a baby last year. Um, and uh, you can see black women have uh, babies at younger ages than white women. Um, so this is not surprising. This is just to illustrate that. But that very um, peaked, the very difference, the different distribution in the peak, um, uh, as juxtaposed to the um, uh, distribution of women who married for the first year. We'll talk about the levels of marriage in one second. We'll talk about the levels of marriage in a minute. But just among the people who did get married in the last year, um, uh, uh, black women are a lot more likely to get married out here, actually above uh, 30 or 35 or 40. But this is a, this is of first marriages. Um, so there's a lot more late marriage going on among black women um, and a lot more early childbearing. And obviously the one consequence of this is non-marital childbearing, Dr. Heaven. If you control for education level in this, do the, are the, the grammar differences so great because there's a correlation between race and education? Um, that will not account for this difference. Um, that will help account. But I'll show you one. I'll show you one um, chart about that. But mm, that doesn't do it by age. But you'll see how big the differences are within education levels. Okay. Okay. So, so if you go with this argument that there's this strong moral, strong salience of the goal of late childbearing for whites who are more dominant in terms of politics and policy. And if you believe or are willing to consider the idea that there's either uh, that there's normative and or health reasons to have children earlier for black families, you see the collision course they're on here as far as the moral condemnation being directed at black women. So um, uh, now, 20 years after welfare reform, um, we're at a point where we're, um, I'm sorry, you have to keep moving the little camera. I'm sure I stand over here. <laughs> um, uh, 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 they told me not to walk in front of the screen, so I, this is the only space I have. Um, uh, 20 years or so after welfare reform, there's something of a consensus emerging among, um, between what they call left and right, which is really between right and center right. You know, that's um, my view between American Enterprise Institute and Brookings put together this working group that kind of got me going on this, or they intervened in the middle when I was working on this, and that sort of the... Um, the, uh, the consensus they reached was, okay, the good part about welfare reform was the work incentives. Um, the bad part was that it was too punitive and, you know, a lot of people ended up with no money at all, and so that's problematic. But the good part was sort of the behavior modification aspect of it. Um, and so work incentives are positive, um, and the other behavior modification piece that they want to bring into future um, attempts to reform the welfare system are this issue of um, delayed responsible childbearing. And this is coming from um, Isabel Sawhill and um, Ron Haskins at Brookings in particular, Sawhill in particular, who wrote a whole book about this. So the idea is to reduce non-marital and unplanned births, emphasis on unplanned because they've really, in a sense, given up on reducing 
non-marital births. Uh, well, they've given up on promoting marriage um, because that didn't work. That was part of the welfare reform, but it didn't work at all. So now, well, maybe we can work on the birth side of this. Okay. So uh, in uh, Sawhill's book, she um, takes this very sort of traditional conservative position of the breakdown of the family um, and this very odd mechanical kind of one-to-one -one thing, which definitely can't really be true, but um, is, is, it sounds like it's, it's an argument. As the breakdown of the family continues, for every child removed from poverty, um, another child will take its place. So uh, it can't really be true. But, but, um, but the idea is that like, as marriage declines, you're wasting your time um, trying to lift children out of poverty because people keep being born to non-married -married, uh, women. Um, and, and if you think about the logic of it, um, except for families whose income falls, um, um, really, the main cause of child poverty is poor people having children, um, or actually, the, or even people who are almost poor having children. Then they're poor because you add a person to their denominator. Um, so, you, so this is really the cause of literally the uh, what you, the proximate cause of poverty is poor people having children. Um, so, um, the solution that they're coming at here that that brought together this left-right consensus is to delay parenthood change the default from having children to not having them until you're both ready to be parents. To bring back stigma, and this is bring back stigma has been a mantra since the 70s. And, um, Bill Cosby actually had a good thing about bringing back stigma um, that they don't talk about anymore. Um, uh, the social norms to bring, so we need to stigmatize unplanned parenthood. So instead of just stigmatizing unmarried parenthood, which they're sort of giving up on, they're moving to unplanned parenthood. So birth should be planful, and if you don't do that, that's the, new, that's the new bad behavior that they should try to, that welfare policy should try to change. Um, so um, uh, the way to do this is with long-acting um, contraceptives. So you, you make it the normal thing to give all women, especially poor women, long-acting contraceptives and make them make an affirmative choice to take it out, an IUD or implant, or to stop um, getting injections. Um, so, do you, so you don't have children by accident anymore. You have to, um, you have to um, do it intentionally. And then... There's the, the, the connection in this, um, in this space between unmarried and unplanned and poverty is a little loosey-goosey, but unmarried is still a big problem. And there's this very, I won't get into this method here, it's, well, it's actually quite simple, um, but the idea is if all women reduce their unintended pregnancies to the rate experienced by college-educated women, the proportion of children born outside of marriage would drop 25%. So you go from 36% uh, 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 children born to unmarried women to 27% of children born to unmarried women if unmarried women had fewer children, which they would do if you il erase the unplanned children from the unmarried women's lives, right? So then they'd be having, because unmarried women have more <laughs> unplanned births. Okay, so it's very me 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 mechanical. Um, but that's sort of, that's where we're going. So here's an um, answer to your question, Heather. Um, race is often not talked about here. Um, because it's polite, in polite society nowadays, when you're talking about poverty and policy, you talk about um, education as a proxy for class, and you talk about class, um, and, and so this is where we get things like um, people with low education, and, and it's the old, low education is the new inner city, when you're, not, when you're trying not to talk about race. But, um, but race is huge, really, really big. So this is the first marriage rate among um, people who have never been married, age 20 to 39, by education and race. And so you can see it's not, uh, having advanced degrees is not getting black women over half the marriage rate of white women with advanced degrees. So education is part of the story, but it's not what, it's not actually what we're talking about. It, it's related. Does that make sense? Is the gap much smaller for men? Uh, I never look at men. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's what they train me in. <laughs> Demography, we just talk about women. Um, uh, it's, it's a good well, question. Well, we're going to talk about your work soon. And I think I was about women, too. But it's a good question. I don't know. Um, see, I have, I have can't respond to this. As soon, whenever Josh Burton says it to me, I'm going to mention this thing that's coming up in the talk. OK, um, that's a good question. OK, so um, uh, back to this issue of the framing. OK, so something they can afford. So, so it's reasonable. It's only fair. And this is very popular. In Washington, everybody's like nodding along when you say it's only reasonable to expect people to not have children if they can't afford to take care of them. Um, and it would be better for them to be financially stable and in a committed relationship, preferably marriage, but they're kind of giving up on that, but financially stable, um, or else you're in the condemnation category. And financially stable as a, as a, as a criterion for being ready 
um, is really just saying poor people don't have children. That's like the solution here. Okay. Um, uh, that, euphemisms aside, um, uh, ready for parenthood when, when financial stability is one of the criteria. Okay. Um, uh, so what are the assumptions here that makes this work? Well, it, it, there are, if you wait longer, your odds of having a good marriage will increase, like they do for our children. Um, if uh, your economic and, and uh, 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 security will increase, your income will go up and you'll become more stable over time. If you, if you rush into it, you're going to have worse economic conditions than if you just wait until after you finish your degrees and, and, um, and get your jobs. Um, and then um, the, the health will not be compromised by this decision to wait. So if you're talking about the difference between 22 versus 28 um, for having your first child, um, waiting for, for the people who are having this conversation, most of them, during that time from 22 to 28, they're going to complete a college degree, marry somebody, um, and, 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 um, and then have their children, then start family. Um, uh, yes? Could you say something about 22 versus 17? Because I mean, typically one right. thinks about... Yes. Now parents being 17, but now, is it really now 22? Super good? interesting. Is it good question. Um, well, well, when I look at the health data, um, we'll, uh, we'll look at that a little bit more. Um, but the Isabel Sawhill came from being the chair of the National Campaign to End Teen Pregnancy, which they then renamed to the National Campaign to End Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy, because we've been so successful with teen pregnancy. Teen, teen births are like way down, um, which is really... I've argued this separately. Teen births don't, I don't think they exist as a category. And the age of first birth has gone up. So teen, teen births have gone down as births have gone up from 22 to 28. Um, so they're not worried so much about teen births anymore. But, um, but that, I mean, not that they're not worried, but they're not, that's not the big policy issue. But the idea is 22 is explicitly talked about as too young. Um, no, I actually made, I just made, pulled those numbers up, but um, now the idea of what makes it too young is not financially ready, not in a stable relationship. Um, but I think with the reference is 22 versus 28 because when you look at the college-bound or in-college white women who almost always have abortions when they get pregnant because they're not ready, they are the ones who are 22 and they know that in the next six years they're going to meet these milestones and it will be, then be appropriate. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, so then there's this issue of, um, of treating unplanned, of, uh, this is more for the culture and, and um, ideational people, um, the more expert on this kind of thing than I am, but this assumption that, that unplanned means unintended, means unwanted, means you didn't, it's like the, we have survey questions for these things, but this is all news <clears> in demography. What do we actually, how do we interpret those? Um, Sahil says poor minority women themselves don't want to have as many children as they are currently having which I don't think is actually true, but they are having births that they describe as unintended at the time that they have them, right? So unintended pregnancy are much higher. So if you ask people in the National Survey of Family Growth, which is where we get this mostly, the last birth you had, was it completely planned? Was it, um, uh, 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 you didn't want it, you wanted to have a baby, but not at that time. And if you want to have a baby, was it like within two years? Or did you want to have one later than that? Or did you never want to have a baby? So that they, that's the question they use. To, 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 uh, to ascertain the intendedness of a birth. But if you ask this, I, this ideal question, which you get from the General Social Survey, um, uh, what's your ideal family size? Poor women um, say they want to have more children. Um, so 65% of them say they have three or more is the ideal family size. Um, but then every month of their life, they may say now is not the right time. Right? So how do you, so what is the, what, how many children do they want to have if they end up having two or three children? They say two or three children is the number that they want to end up in the end. And so you, you're dealing with the question of, like Paul England would say, you've got a question of self-efficacy here. And if you're not, it's not ready, you may kind of do it anyway. And it doesn't mean you didn't want to do it. You, it's, it's complicated. OK. Um, it's certainly not so simple as saying, oh, I'll get you one next. It's certainly not as simple as saying that these births that are in the unintended category like are just, we shouldn't have them. Right? That's, that's, the, the women themselves don't go that far. Yes. Um. I mean, I actually, I think Trussell and others have done a lot of work trying to tease apart these different versions of wanted and intendedness. Okay. Um, I do think you find, if you juxtapose measures of, various measures of looking back and saying, did you want it and is it your ideal family? And they don't actually ask, did you, do you now wish that child had never been born? But they can juxtapose these ideal family size questions and the wantedness questions. And you do find much higher rates of essentially, I wish I hadn't had 
mm -hmm. child, I had a low, I have a child, sure. much higher rates among low-income women. Yeah. So I don't think it's, a, I think among women of all types, mm -hmm. you do find a certain number at every level of social class who actually say, who could, would say if being handed, that was a birth that I would have been better for everybody if that birth had not happened. And that is more common among women. Yes. So let's, I don't want to kind of gloss over that. No, but it's uh, but I wouldn't go to the other extreme to say the way the NSFG asks it is um, I think they first ask if you were contracepting at the time that you had pregnancy and then they yeah. go and then there are some special supplements that have asked some other kinds of intentional yeah. questions. But I, I would not want to go to, to all the way to the other extreme of saying the ones that are categorized as unintended uh, are all in that category that you just no, described. No. Yeah. No, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, are there any questions that you have that gauge that are that, that gauge like unplanned versus like or unintended versus intended that are like more in the middle of the spectrum as opposed to either like unintended or like in like intended but within like a certain amount of time? Like, yeah. Um, you had a child that you weren't that you hadn't intended, but like you had a conversation about it in, like, in the past. Yeah. You know? So let's just say yeah. So that's one of the one of the options in this question. Let's just say that there's a continuum of wantedness that poor women and black women probably are more likely to have kids in the, on, the, on, the, on the unintended side of that spectrum. And yet also, in an ideal sense, they also would like to have more children when you ask them, in this case, at a young 18 to 34, what is the ideal? So I think we can balance all three, we can, all three of those facts can exist. And the question of the magnitudes um, is obviously important, but it's not, so no one's going to give me uh, I mean, no, no one's going to give me a number that, to, that can resolve that. I think I, I'm, I'm satisfied that we have those, that those things are all, you know, in, in some kind of tension. Okay. Um, okay. Um, on the, so now I'll give a little bit of um, the, the data stuff on what I have on this. Um, if you look at the... Um, uh, uh, just children living with their parents, and so it's a little kid with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I have the CPS data. Um, uh, this is lots of ways to do this kind of thing. But um, uh, if you look at have a, a children who are currently living with their parents up to age um, 15, I think I did for this, um, uh, the older the mother, um, the, the less the, at the time, and when you just subtract child's age from mother's age, the older the mother at the time of the birth, the lower the poverty <coughs> rate up to about age 30. Um, and you can see the supplemental poverty versus official poverty. Oh, here I am. The, the supplemental poverty versus official poverty um, uh, difference there, but the pattern is similar. But when you look at the never married mothers, there is no relationship there, right? So with supplemental poverty, which is uh, the preferred measure if you have it, um, the, the, the age of the mother is not associated with, hold on, I'll get to some more variables, um, is not associated with the poverty rate, the age of the mother at the time of the birth. Um, when you um, control for the child sex, uh, age, nativity, and the mother's marital status, and do this by, by region and metro residence. And you do it by race. This is really where I'm getting at. Um, there's a basis for the white, um, uh, the, the white norm that um, waiting is good, right? Because even controlling for those things, um, you do find um, uh, this relationship where the older the older the mother, the lower the poverty rate. Not so much for black uh, and Hispanic mothers. Um, I didn't control for education here, and the issue is because it's totally endogenous with the birth and marriage and stuff. Um, so so you, you see the basis for the norm, and then you see sort of the clash with the, um, the reality. Now, um, just, just one yeah. quick comment. Mm -hmm. um, you might actually decide that you want to control for education because it's not totally endogenous. Forty years ago it was, when young women were forced to drop out of high school, but now actually there's a whole range of supports at every level of education. So it is endogenous, but not entirely so. Yeah, sure. And indeed, some women choose to have babies precisely when they're in school, graduate students especially, because it kind of yeah. is a less... Uh, yeah, there, there just aren't very many of them. So I'm gonna just, that's, that's good advice. Um, uh, actually, my uh, own mother was very um, insistent that graduate school was the perfect time to have a child. And then she said, uh, when early in our faculty career was the perfect time to have a child. And then she said, right after <laughs> 10 years, the perfect time to have a child. Um, anyway, so just a little bit on the poverty. Poverty is not so much my um, um, 
issue, I did a little bit more of this on the health, so this is infant mortality. And infant mortality is a very rare outcome, fortunately, but I consider it sort of like the tip of the spear that I just said yesterday, same expression. Um, you figure if one group has higher infant mortality than the other, that I'm, I take that to mean that they have worse health um, in general, and that's just the extreme case. And that, obviously that's not a perfect, um, but it's pretty good, and we have a lot of good data on infant mortality, and it's, um, it's something you can measure without, obje without subjectively asking health status and, and so on. So for this, I took um, the 2013 infant birth death file, um, where I got race and age and ethnicity, um, but not uh, place of birth or uh, uh, more of the ancestry. Um, so I just used the Mexican uh, group instead of combining all, um, all Latinas. Um, and uh, some covariates I can put in, uh, parity, plurality, smoking education, uh, what the month that they first uh, saw a doctor and how they paid. Other things they did not have um, that I guess that I see other people using, so I must have done something wrong or I didn't get the right file or something. Uh, BMI, alcohol, nativity, geography. Okay, so but the key issue here is age and um, and uh, uh, risk of infant mortality, which I think is a proxy for health. So just in the um, uh, unadjusted, you see the the solid line, the dark line with the white circles. This is white women, and you see the um, again the strong basis for the norm of weight. So the healthiest. The lowest risk of infant mortality is age 30 to 34 for white mothers, um, after which it goes up, but doesn't really go up very much until after 40. Um, uh, uh, for Hispanic women, it shifted a little to the left, and for black women, it's pretty flat, right? So the, it's obviously much higher, but um, there's a little bit of a benefit to, um, uh, to waiting for black women, but that's, this is unadjusted. So when we adjust, it's shocking, shocking. The, it's strictly linearly up for black women. The longer they wait, the higher the risk of infant mortality. Um, uh, and this is going down to 12 to 17 in answer to your... Um, Did you mean par is parity plurality? No, parity is how many kids they've had before. I know, but what was plurality? Plurality is how many kids they're having at that moment. I see. Did you have parity in the model? Yes, uh, yes parity and plurality. <coughs> Got it. Okay. Good, thank you. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. It's demography, right? We're talking, we're talking about parity and plurality. Um, okay, so on the adjusted, right. So the adjusted, the shape for the white and Mexican women is quite similar um, with, the, with the, big, the lowest risk down here at age 30. Um, and this is where norms are made. That is very strong. This has been this way for a long time. But for black women, it's just the longer they wait, the worse the risk. Um, yes? So when I read this paper, I was, the, the last phase you had, it's the same thing. The longer they wait, the worse the risk. Uh, that's a causal interpretation of this, whereas we, we if the same sure. person waits, they'll have more risk. But a lot of what's going on, we know, is who's having the kid. Yeah. Uh, but that's not what the controls are supposed to be taking care of. A little. Uh, a little. A little. A little. A little. Okay. Are, you, are you really making the argument that, that we should see these, that these are at least perceived as risks that are caused by age? Uh, I don't know. No, I don't know that. So I, I thought it was just a descriptive statement, the longer they wait, the higher their risk. But Arlene Geronimus okay. made the same argument a while back, and she argues actually that it is a weathering hypothesis. Yeah. But, right? that, that's what I said. Yeah. I know, exactly. So I'm just so, saying... Okay. Just to, uh, yeah, so it, there is an argument that it is, so this is, is an age effect because of weathering, because their health deteriorates, because of mm -hmm. racism. No, I'm thinking of well, the kind of people that have births late yeah. versus early, yeah. that, that's, that that sorting is going to differ between the groups. But there's no, there's no difference in health. There's no difference in weathering. It's just who decides to wait and who doesn't. There's a different mechanism for these different groups. You can, you can do that if you think that I'm definitely not capturing that by parity, plurality, smoking, education, medical care, yeah. payment source. Come on. Partner, <laughs> partnership markets. Right. We'll get to that. Okay. Okay, but yes. Okay, fine. Uh, yes, go ahead. Well, I mean, you have big confidence intervals there. Like, are you confident you can distinguish <laughs> even between the lowest and highest? Groups. Yes. That difference is well, different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and when you put it in linearly, it's it works linearly. Yeah. And you could you could do it that way too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I I it's big of me to show you the confidence intervals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. That's you know it's much. I'm not a statistical expert, but the the, the numbers are less than 0.05. Yeah. Yes. So, so, as yeah, you said, 12 to 17, smaller and smaller fractions. Yeah. Um, so if you take 12 to 17 out, then it looks like the risk is pretty flat for whites before increasing, and for blacks, if you take 12 to 17 out, it looks like it's... Right. With common intervals, that first bit is pretty flat. Yeah, but it's linear. The, it's quite strong if you put it in linear. 
Right, late. Well, I'm saying if you take the age 12 to 17 out, if you say, we're not like teens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, you can, yeah, if you want to look at it like this, yeah, yeah, you would find it a pretty strong positive relationship with age, but it wouldn't be as dramatic. True. Uh, and when, when, would be very different. Well, yeah, but when, when Geronimus first wrote about this, she was describing it as J-shaped, right? Um, so this is actually pretty high compared to the stuff that she found, mm -hmm. which tended to be in the J. Yeah, selection. yeah the selection, because there's less of it, there's less of it going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, it's a huge, huge issue. Absolutely huge issue. Josh is completely right. Okay. Uh, who else? I was just going to ask, my recollection, recollection of Geronimus and the weathering was really about race and class. I remember yeah. we talking about poor African-American women in Harlem yeah. had this much higher risk of maybe yeah. infant mortality. Yeah, you um, went to grad so school at the same time. it's interesting that this yeah. seems to extend, it, it's not contingent on class right. that you're seeing these race differences, but I just wanted to... She did it in specific time. geographic areas. She did one in Michigan, she did one in Harlem, and then, but she, we've moved, to, the literature has moved to this national, yeah, it's real for this. So this, there was a... There's a paper that's about 10 years older than this that I'm updating, which had the same pattern okay. um, for the national um, and controlling for education pattern. I'm thinking about the, the theoretical mechanism. Yeah. The weathering seemed to be partly about the economic deprivation right. and the class piece of it. Right. But this suggests maybe it's something So the, the, what the clash we have here is, um, is between the selection things we can't account for and the <coughs> economic things that we can't account for. <coughs> Right, so what is it? So, you know, I, I say many times all over the place that controlling for education and calling that <clears throat> handling the class problem is ridiculous, right? The years of education is, doesn't begin to describe the, the, the health and income and, and home ownership and all the stuff about everybody and everybody in their networks and, and all that. So, yeah, this is, uh, that's a big, okay. Um, uh, I, yes. I <laughs> Which is that I wonder to the extent, I know you control for parity, presumably in a linear way, one, two, three, four, as a linear function. But I'm not asking whether Probably you Probably not. not. No, I didn't. I think I did but categorically. In a way, her starting argument is about when you start childbearing. It's not really about all the babies that you have. Um, so I just think it might be. In, Back to Sawhill, not to run us. Uh huh. Sorry. Uh -huh. Um, and it's actually about an intendedness and when you start childbearing as well. But that, so we've kind of elided this with a, with a different issue. And it is very striking that the health risks for older childbearing are so much higher for African, that they grow in a different way, but they do grow for all those groups. As we say, if we truncate, if we chop off 12 to 17. Yeah, only really only at the forty plus yeah. range. I mean, the, right. yeah. So women, so this the thirty upper thirties where black women are in much poorer health yeah, than nice. women of other groups. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's not really the same issue as whether it's a good idea to delay childbearing because very few women delay their first birth until late thirties. That's not really the idea at all. Right. Uh, right. So twenty two to twenty eight. Right? Yeah, and so your twenty two to twenty eight issue, the difference isn't really very big. Uh, no, I could do it in five or ten. So uh, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to kind of think through the, the healthy yeah. issue. Yeah, yeah. It's very important. Uh, yeah, but the argument, the Geronimo's argument is really partly about culture and norms. And so it's not so much we're not literally trying to plan out the life calendar for people. We're trying to understand where expectations and norms and, and shame and moral approbation come from. And so in that sense, it's, it's not like I'm not giving advice to grad students about how to organize their lives. We're talking about why communities come to so firmly believe the things they believe about what's appropriate and acceptable and normal. Okay. Okay. All right. um, so that's, you know, that's not a dodge. That just means it's, it's, a, it's, it's a slightly different issue. Then it's not exactly a public health question of what, exactly when, at what age should we trigger the distribution of free birth control? Yes? This might be a slight tangent, but I'm struggling with conflating uh, the causes for infant mortality with women's health. Uh -huh. And I understand how you think about it as an indicator of population level health, but just Googling causes of infant mortality, I get leading causes, birth asphyxia, pneumonia, term birth complications, infection, diarrhea, malaria, measles, and nutrition. Yeah. And so I wonder if like younger black women that have their mothers around to help with things that our healthcare system is not 
funded enough to deal with, you know, like I just wonder about the socioeconomic factors surrounding these families playing a part. In that are situation. somehow separate from the mother's health? Oh yeah. No, no, I mean, these things are... Um, I mean, they're connected to some degree, but it's not just the mother's health. It's not the mother's health separate from those things, but mother's health comes from all those things. Yeah, yeah that's so exactly right. Um, yes. How much care they have, uh, how healthy they are. White yes, whoever. exactly. Thank you. Okay, um, let me just do this briefly. I'll talk about marriage timing a little. Um, interesting thing happened on the way to this cohort growing up. Um, so, um, Goldstein and Kenny, Goldstein and Kenny had this article, which is fascinating. Um, it's really good. Um, and it's very popular, it's cited all the time. And the interesting thing about it is, one interesting thing about it, besides the substance of it, is if you look at how people cite it, they still cite it as predicting the future. Um, <laughs> all the time. It's, like, it's cited a hundred times a year or something with people saying, well, but you know, the current generation is going to, it's really interesting. But eventually, you know, predictions, we get to, ch so the interesting thing is, um, what I'm interested in is why the model undershot black women's marriage rates. And I think the answer is their marriage, they got married later more, I think this is almost by definition what happened, they got married later than the model predicted. So it's not just that they got married more, but their marriages were later. So it's not that, so that, it's not that they were getting married at age 25 more than the model predicted. I don't even understand how the model works, honestly. But, um, but, it, but after the, you know, in the, as the cohort aged, so now they're 51 to 55, um, they got married more. So I'm going to show you this model for, um, for predicting black women's marriage. And the interesting thing, and this gets to the whole issue of like, is, is, our pro is this like a moment? Like why, um, what are black women doing wrong here besides having children when they're poor and having children when they're young, but they're also getting, they are getting married later, um, but not earlier. So now you're into whoever said the thing about the partner of the selection availability issue. So let's talk about that a little. So... Um, I beefed this up for this talk because of the demography. Um, so this is multiple decrement life table. Um, so this is the other way of doing this. Um, uh, besides the, the model um, that Josh used, if you just take one year of cross-sectional data and you look at the first marriage rates by age, and then you have another column with the mortality rates by age, you goose the mortality rates by marital status. So you look at the mortality rates by race and never married, for never married women. And so there's basically two ways out of the model, right? You can die or get married. And that's why it's multiple decrement. Um, you can do the same thing with divorce, by the way. And you can do it with ACS. And I have done this also, um, where um, you can be widowed or divorced, right? And the ACS allows you to, to, to do that, to do that both. And that, this both come from the same Sam Preston paper that I got the formula from, which I didn't learn in grad school. So anyway, so if you look at um, if you look at black women age forty five who've never been married, they have a fifty percent chance of getting married still in their life. Okay, according to this model. I'm, uh, I'm just looking at the older ages. It seems these extremely high marriage rates, of first marriage rates of people in their sixties and seventies among black yeah, women. Exactly, ten percent of black women uh, who survived to age seventy, never having been married, get married. I'm. I'm that's, look, it's in the Much direction. more than that. A hundred percent of them do. No, no. This is the chance if of ever married. If they live to be 90, a hundred percent of them get married. Because they go from 10% no, no, percent percent not married, married to zero percent not married. No. Uh, no, 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 no. This is the chance of marriage. This is not not married. This is married. Yeah. The chance of ever married. A hundred percent of people marry no. by age. No. No. hundred percent of people no. don't marry. Zero percent marry. Of ever married. People this is the chance married. of ever marrying. So the chance of ever marrying is zero if you get to 95. Is this a survival curve or not? Yes. No, 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 no. This is the survival curve. Oh. <laughs> this is, this is, I, I could have showed them in the other order, okay? This is the chance that you will get married further down the table. This is, this is the additional up, probability of marrying in yeah. the this is next some, year? No, ever. In the future. Ever. Summing, ever. Down, summing down the table from where you are right now, chance of marrying. Ever, uh, chance of ever. Right. So if you if you are alive at forty five, and you sum up the probabilities below, taking out the people who die, half of them will get married before they die. Does that make sense? Yeah. Fine. Okay. So it does put a lot on what happened in two thousand ten, but that's the way life tables work. If you look at it this way, you can pretend we showed this one first. This is the this is the cumulative percentage who ever married before they die. 
right? And the interesting thing here is at the end, the gap is not that huge. It's 85% of white women and 70% of black women who live to be 100 will eventually get married. And those peak out, you know, around 70 or something. Um, so, but what's really interesting is this huge gap in here, right? So at age 35, it's, a, you know, almost a 30% difference. Um, uh, uh, but, by, but they catch up quite a bit. And I think, uh, oh, I don't have the figure that shows. If you look at the distribution of when the marriages are, it goes back to the first thing I showed. There's a big bulge of black women over age 40 getting married. Yes. But by the time you're 60 and this thing has like gotten close, you're not looking after your children anymore. Right. And you, if your daughters are having children relatively early compared to whites, then you're probably going to look after their kids higher. Right. right. So the issue is when you're 50, what's going on? Right. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I, right. I just think that is right. Uh, yes. I, I'm just thinking about the fact that this period is really the, the depth of the recession and wondering if that affected blacks more than whites, whether this would look the same, right, right, a little right. bit more recent or a bit earlier. Than yeah, relative you, to no, it did not affect blacks more than whites. Yeah. Everybody put off marriage in the recession. Yeah, everyone sort of put off marriage in the recession. Not, that, not as much as they put off fertility. Maybe. True. Right. I think. Yeah. Think. Everyone um, thought marriage, so it yeah. wasn't. We, we do not find, using the ACS data, we do not yeah. find an interaction between race and poor economic conditions on marriage during yeah. the session. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you could easily update this, um, although not so easy because they don't publish the mortality rates by marital status very. The last one was 2007. Although, honestly, that's more heat than light on it. It doesn't do much, but I do like having it in there. Um, okay, yeah, so the question is. So for our overall picture of like what's happening, what's wrong, what's right, what should policy be trying to do, I think it's relevant, and what I just don't know is exactly why or how it's relevant, that the, merit, the black marriage rates catch up so much, or may catch up so much, um, compared, to, uh, compared to earlier in life. And what, so, you, so really what you have is a lot of women with 20-year-olds getting married for the first time. Um, and so uh, I feel like the... It's sort of like um, we're, uh, you know, I'm revising my textbook. Um, Multi-party multi fertility is like one of those things that the, our data is just not doing a very good job of capturing at all. Like the big data sources don't do much for multiple partner fertility, um, multi-partner fertility. Um, uh, it's sort of these, these complexities that aren't part of our modeling yet. And uh, that's why I kind of use that example from the prediction model because um, uh, the idea of this late marriage as a, as a Pretty prominent feature is not really something that we're processing well or very much yet. So are you thinking of the, let's say, marriage, first marriages over 50 as kind of re-partnering? Probably. Like the, first, yeah. the first partner that was not a marriage and this is now a yeah. re-partnering? Re yeah, so it's not like Sweden where people live together for 20 years and then get married. I don't think that happens so much. So that's it, right. And so, so, this is, so this is a big story about family complexity. Right, so they maybe maybe they have another kid, maybe their partner has a kid, maybe their kids one kid is gone, <clears throat> and so on. Right, so it's a huge. It's not. This is not like um, legitimizing those children born twenty years earlier, probably. Yeah. Yes, I say legitimizing. You know, ironically. Well, actually, I don't want to cut you off if you want to finish. No, that's fine. Um. Well, okay. Anecdote of one. <laughs> they always are. <laughs> can I can I do that, please? Is the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> As long as it's not about graduate students. Um, <laughs> a low-income African-American woman who married at 45 and was divorced by 46 uh -huh. because basically she wanted to be married, to have been married. Is this um, thing online? Somebody, I mean, this. Oh. No, I mean, is this computer yeah. online? Okay, fine. I've got, there's a, for late marriages, just as an aside, there's a very high divorce rate in the first year or two. So it's not an anecdote anymore. It's true. Fine, thank you. Okay. <laughs> sure, but what about it? Oh, so you're saying, you're just pointing out that late marriages can be disastrous also. No, I'm actually saying that the whole function of marriage is different at that age. Mm -hmm. And one of the things it could be is essentially a bucket list phenomenon. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I mean, <laughs> I'm serious. Eventually, I want, always wanted to get married. Now I'm, this is my That's last right. chance. Right. Fine. I, yeah, sure. Yes. I, I don't know. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, there's a lot of other reasons it's difficult to reconcile. But younger people can treat marriage as a bucket list phenomenon at a much earlier age, because for them, if they don't get married by 30, it's catastrophic. So, they're, so they, they, they may behave the same way, but at a different, under a different normative framework. Okay, let, let's let you finish up till one, and then okay. we'll ask more questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Conclusion.
and then I'll wrap up and then we'll, then we'll, then we'll go to questions. Um, okay, so I just think it's important to realize, and it's important to realize, especially in settings like elite college campuses, no offense, I include my own in that, um, how much what's normal and normative and expected and good for whites drives all of our thinking on this. Not all of us individually, I mean all of our thinking. Um, uh, and when that is such a strong normative message and everybody you know, is swimming in that world, what it's also doing, because as norms do, is creating a package of moral condemnation for people who don't. So the, the contrast is the way norms work. I, I'm not an expert on norms, but... Is that right, Claude? <laughs> anyway, yeah, Heather says, yeah, okay, fine. Um, uh, I just, uh, um, just joshing you, so to speak. Um, okay, so, so, the, so, so just, to, just, to, just to be cognizant of that, the, the, when the one thing is validated, the other thing is condemned. Okay, um, and um, that the consensus we're moving out of as we go into poverty policy and welfare reform now is that the responsibility frame and the behavior modification frame are what have survived welfare reform. So the details of the policy are, you know, debated. Maybe it was too punitive at the bottom. Maybe the block grants idea was not a good idea. All that stuff is being argued. But there's a pretty strong consensus that using welfare policy to modify family choice, family type behavior is a good idea, that we have good reason to think it kind of worked in this previous case. And this responsibility frame is how you sell Responsibility frame is how liberals think they're going to sell welfare to the majority. It's by packaging it as this responsible thing. So, come on. You people can't, not you people, because that would be racist. You can't just go on having children wherever you want. You've got to give us something. We're going to give you welfare, but you've got to do your part um, also and be responsible. And that is sort of the, that's the political framing that we've settled on as something that's going to work to sell welfare to convince white people that black people can, should have welfare. Essentially, right? Um, and so I think that's problematic, to use the sociological term. I'd like to interrogate that. <laughs> <laughs> Unpack it and repack it in a different way um, with something like giving poor people money. Okay. Um, so uh, as you can see, the two parts of the thing don't fit <coughs> here, so that's what I'm really interested in, but I'm interested in whatever your comments are. Thanks. Okay, so a few last bullet points here. Cool. Yes. Um, so it depends on the nature of the income maintenance experiment that you're going to run, because I'm thinking about the Seattle and Denver independence experiments that don't really support action on some of these other things, right? That, which I read for a class by the institute mm -hmm. a long time ago and barely remember. So, um, okay. yeah, so it's basically, how are you going to get income, right? So you have to think about the nature of the policy steps that will be taken to provide this universal basic income would probably be the easiest thing to have, right? Yep. That, I'm Canadian, so I'm always hopeful about right. these things. Yep. Um, the whole poverty problem, yeah. all, if you take all the, just for scale, yeah. if you take all the families with children below the poverty line and you figure out how far below <coughs> the poverty line they all are, it adds up, last I checked, to $68 billion. So $68 billion, if, you, if you, everybody stands still and you give them the money, is how much it costs to bring every poor family with children up to the poverty line. Now, of course, as soon as you do that, they're going to become even lazier, and so you have to, you know, <laughs> figure out a way to, to do that better. So economists hate that when I say that. But that's just something, that's just about scale. It's not an actual policy suggestion. Yeah. Cool. Notice I didn't interrupt, so I'm going to ask two questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One is to dis discuss the implication of the Hispanic data, uh, since in terms of financial stress, um, even cultural stress, um, there's no reason to believe that uh, they should look like whites. Maybe, right. they, maybe they shouldn't look like blacks, but, they, but in your data, they should, why in the world they should look like whites? It makes, it this is why we know that argument. That's, that's race sure absolutely does not reduce to class. It's not that blacks are poor and that's the problem. Absolutely. Okay. Correct. So, so what you're asking, so what is the answer? Well, so the question is all the other things about their lives. I mean, the, so there's all... Obviously, a vast literature on why immigrants are healthier, um, uh, which is a kind of selection stuff, but also uh, 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 um, uh, things in the context of reception, and there's a whole, the whole thing about it. So you're that. punting on that. Somebody else will answer that question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, secondly, the, the, from behavior to norms is an interesting uh, move because it reminds me of the literature on uh, academic achievement. 
in which um, uh, the data clearly, when last time I looked at it, showed that at black aspirations for academic achievement, both by parents and by children, are as high, or in some cases exceed those of white kids. But the outcome is different. Your, part of your argument was, you know, blacks have this different um, uh, profile, uh, uh, birth giving profile. It fits their life circumstances. Doesn't fit white's life circumstances. It fits their life circumstances. It's sort of so they, they must they have whites have norms that fit white circumstances. Blacks have norms that fit black circumstances. But it's not clear that that. I mean, it seems to me I don't know the data, so I'm asking you. I mean, do black young black women want to have years of single motherhood? Mm -hmm. um, and and. If not, or in fact, is this, is this a gap between their own norms, which they share basically with the whites and the here? Well, so the... Okay, well, the direction of the different... When you compare education to the birth thing, it's always easier to have high aspirations and not meet them. That's not, that's not an accomplishment, in the sense that that's not pulling off something difficult to imagine. Um, that's just failing to meet your goals. So, so if you're, so, so as far as the comparison, which is interesting, if your aspirations are to be married and have children, uh, as to have children when you used to be married before you have children, to have a family with marriage and children, and that's your goal, um, and you don't succeed at doing that, this is what you would get. So it's actually just kind of the same as the educational aspirations. You have an aspiration that they don't meet. Um, I think the literature on aspirations and goals is that um, uh, black women maybe not as much as white women, but pretty much think being married when they have children would be great, think marriage is an important part of their lives, they expect to get married eventually, the different ways people ask this. Yeah, um, but so, so, so the point would be that uh, uh, a policy which found a way to allow black women to fit the nationally shared set of goals, mm -hmm. Would well, not be a cultural right. no, you're position, right. but would actually be right. supportive of their cultural. Right, right. No, so that's the, but the question, I guess, is right. So the question is, and so Andy Churlin makes this case when he says, "Look at the depression. You know, you don't think they had hard times in the depression, and they everybody still got married before they had children, right?" So he's got he compares. He's got four. It's a nice and it's that labor's love lost book. He's got that nice comparison: college graduates today, women without college today, people in the Great Depression, whites in the Great Depression back then, blacks. So this from two by two thing. And there are, so he basically says you have to have the, the, the bad economic conditions, ec insecurity and all that, and a normative framework that permits having children outside of marriage, um, that allows that to be an acceptable fallback. So, so I think if you think about it that way, so you're 22 years old, you share this national cra craving for uh, marriage and childbearing. It's not happening because you can't find the, the um, from the woman's perspective, the man to do this, or he's not there, or he's not reliable, is not employed, or whatever, all the problems that, um, that get in the way of that marriage, then you, if, if your normative framework then allows you to have children anyway and settle for that, then that's, that's, the, the, that's sort of the fallback in the Kathleen Kirsten's kind of sense. Um, is that in my answer? Am I punting on that question too? Yeah. Okay. Josh. So, um, to go back to the issue of causality, I think one way to read your paper is let's let's actually get some identified analysis that says what is the effect mm -hmm. for whites of waiting and what is the causal effect for blacks of waiting. And in thinking about that, uh, it seems we do have one natural experiment that was the recession, and we saw, at least according to the discussion that you and Danny just had, that both black women and white women both decided to wait when times got tough. So it seems that at least in the, that's not a very rigorous design, but that's already showing us that even though the cross-sectional age patterns may be different, that you're showing, that actually a marginal the, the revealed preference, the revealed, that be, the revealed causal chain is the same for black and white women, that when times get tough, they think waiting will help. So it could be in that case that what we're not capturing with our socioeconomic status variables and stuff, for example, is the job status and security of the male partner, right? Who's not in the picture, who's not in the home, and through the ACS or whatever. So in that case, what you're what you're getting at is um, 
So you could make a case that really this economics does drive all this, and our economic measures don't adequately capture how... I think I'm arguing that the, 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 the normative response for white women and black women mm -hmm. at the individual level is both waiting is going to help me in tough times. Mm -hmm. It's the same. Right. It's not different. Whereas you're arguing yeah. that maybe it's different. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good point. Uh, so I guess, I don't know, so is the question, is the answer to that to figure out the causal effect on health or to figure out the, the causal determination of child timing? Uh, I think I that's think, the one I'd be I more interested the, in, the second the, one. The, the kind of policy question you raise is, by urging white and black women to wait, are we going to get the same outcome? And you're right. suggesting maybe we won't. Right. And there are designs. I mean, there's the, um, I'm forgetting her name right now, who does uh, miscarriages and looks at the effect of, uh, of non-intended intentional waiting right. so that, uh, on, I think her outcome is women's wages. But one could easily look at something else with that. It's probably hard to do that design by subgroup. But I mean, there are various designs that are going to get us at uh, what's the effect of waiting on different groups mm -hmm. in a causal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Okay, yeah. I'm thinking about the absent men because they're all in jail, um, and there are there's variation both over time and um, within time across space and rates of incarceration. Oh, oh, um, Relative rates of incarceration of blacks, which is why yeah. might help you get us into this. No, and I think that's right. And I think that causes family instability, causes economic instability, right. it causes separate rights. So I teach, I um, always teach, um, um, doing the best I can, the uh, in a Nelson book on this because mm -hmm. on the life course implications, and there's other work on incarceration, right. but the, the other thing we're not capturing well at all, I think you would agree, is the life course implications of incarceration on couples and people, and so it's like psychological, it's economic, it's uh, addiction, it's, uh, 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 it's mobility, I mean, geographic mobility, and all this, the, the cascading things that come from, yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't have, Danny, will you give something more? No, no, yeah. I, would, I mean, if you could put that in, so I'm actually interested that I, I, I have a paper that's not getting out right now because the results are so underwhelming for, um, um, for it makes me assume I have specified it wrong, um, oh. For the um, for um, male uh, the male job situation impact on black women's uh, likelihood of marriage, right? So you build a marriage model uh, with uh, with age and education and stuff, and then you run it across three hundred metropolitan areas and put the male unemployment rate in separately by race, and it just doesn't do very much. Um, and the number of eligible men are you are you guys working on this too? I'm happy to share what I have. Does it by incarceration rates? It oh. doesn't do very much. It does not do very much. Yeah. At the, you mean the local incarceration rate? No, we got states. The state, yeah, but a bit, you mean in the, the incarceration rate of the men in their marriage market or something like it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so as far as the Cherlin argument, it, it, it's like you're not going to, it appears, <clears throat> we're not going to have the variables to build this and say this is why this is, like there's, uh, there's like, you don't, I don't know if the culture people are, you know, like this culture as a residual thing, but you know, you keep adding variables and when the variables can't explain the race effect, you know, then you fall back on anthropology, you know. And I'm not sure that's adequate. Am I supposed to wrap up? I think that's great time. Thank you so much. For